Praise the Lord. Good morning, IPC Hebron. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He's not here. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. As Charles Spurgeon said, and I'll paraphrase it, the cross is the resplendent display of unmerited favor, unexpected mercy, and unexampled uh, uh, love that the Lord showed for us on the cross. Amen. On a hill called Calvary stands an endless mercy tree. Every broken, weary soul, find your rest and be made whole. Stripes of blood that stain its frame, shed to wash away our shame. From our, uh, his scars, pure love was released. Salvation by what he did on that mercy tree. Amen. In the spot between the two thieves hung the blameless Prince of Peace, beaten, battered, scarred and scorned, sacred head pierced by our thorns. It is finished, was his cry. The perfect lamb was crucified. His sacrifice, our victory, our savior chose to go to the mercy tree. Hope went dark that violent day. The whole earth quaked on love's display. Three days silent in the ground, his body born from heaven's crown. On that bright and glorious day, when heaven opened up the grave, it is said he is alive, risen indeed. Praise him for the mercy tree. Hallelujah. Amen. Death has died and love has won. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus Christ has overcome. He has risen from the dead. That is our blessed hope and that's what we were singing about. And, though, and so one day very soon we will see his face and every tear he will wipe away. No more pain or suffering. Praise him for his mercies upon me. Upon me. Put your name there and say, praise God for his mercy upon me. Because on a hill on Calvary in Golgotha stood the endless mercy tree. This was a line from a lyric, uh, a song sang by Charles Billings. I normally say it at the end, but I thought with today's meaning, it was very important to say it at the beginning. Propitiation means that Christ's sacrifice satisfied God's wrath on the cross. And Jesus, when he went to the cross and sacrificed himself, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He was talking about each one of us when we commit sin. He said, forgive him. Forgive Minu. Forgive each and every person here, for they do not know what they do. The Lord Jesus has, uh, uh, has propitiated for us and taken the, uh, God's wrath and satisfied it. And by his sacrifice, we have the victory. We have the victory. Amen. So you might wonder, what does this have to do with the book of James? We're on chapter 2 of James, doers of the word and not just hearers. I'll take you to chapter 2 of James, uh, verse 8, 10, uh, uh, 10. And the sermon titled is Mercy Triumphs Over Judgment. And the subtitle I gave it is Pay Back the Hesed You Have Received. And I'll explain what that means. Mercy Triumphs Over Judgment. If you would go to that verse, James chapter 2, verse 8. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you're doing well. For whoever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point, has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of all of the law. So speak and act as those who have been judged under the law of liberty or freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. James chapter 2 verse 13, it ends by saying mercy triumphs over judgment. Now what does that exactly mean in, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so? The remaining time we will go through and understand that. But a perfect example in my mind of this you might all be familiar with the story of uh, Botham and Brant Jean. 
You might have heard the story. It was on September 6, 2018 in Dallas, Texas. Batam Jean, he was born in St. Lucia. He was an excellent student. He was a child of God. He came to uh, the university here in Arkansas and he became an accountant and he was living in his apartment and a police officer uh, parked on the wrong floor uh, of his apartment and came in and uh, came into his uh, apartment and thought it was her apartment and then shot him and killed him thinking they was an intruder. I'm sure all of you have heard the story about Batam Jean. He was a worship leader. He was a preacher in his church. He was by all accounts and everyone that listened to him a true child of God, and, and he was raised as such, as you can tell. We're familiar because his 18-year-old brother, this young man, Brant Jean, at the time of his judgment, uh, he said, I forgive you to the police officer, and said, I don't want you to go to jail. I want you to know Jesus. And we see that uh, he asked to hug her and said, can I give you a hug? And this was an extraordinary act of kindness and mercy, and it was all over the news. The world was astounded, saying, how could this be? His brother was just murdered. How could this young man uh, show such forgiveness? In fact, the judge in this case was so moved, she went and got her Bible and gave it to the, uh, gave it to the police officer. She got 10 years in prison, and hopefully uh, she is able to read the Bible and understand through this act of tragedy, the legacy of mercy that was left behind. Amen. So what does this mean? Mercy triumphs over judgment. And we will study that in detail. First, let's take a look at the parable of the unforgiving, unmerciful uh, servant. We see that in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 23 to 35, it says... Apostle Peter asks, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And the Lord answers and said, no, not, se not seven times, 70 times, but se 70 times seven. 70 times seven. So basically, endless forgiveness, right? The context of this pa passage was Jesus teaching his disciples about the kingdom of heaven. And he was teaching the important principles uh, to his uh, his believers. See, uh, we see a servant who owed 10,000 talents from the Lord, uh, from a, a master. And uh, he went and begged and pleaded, and the, and the Lord decided that the servant's $10,000, uh, 10,000 talents would be forgiven of him, which is a lot of money, a lot, millions of dollars, let's say, in today's um, money. But unwilling to forgive his brother, we see uh, that when he came out of this, he was not willing to forgive his brother of, ten, uh, of 100 denarii. So the comparison, I've said this here before, is like, let's say you get forgiven for a million dollars, but then uh, you see that, uh, that he's not willing to forgive someone over a can of soda. Imagine that. So what did the master or the Lord do? See, we see the Lord uh, was the one who forgave first. We cannot earn it. He could not have earned it. But he didn't understand that the Lord had forgiven him of so great a debt. And he was living and he wanted a little bit back from his fellow brother. One of, to him who understands that much or all of your sins are forgiven, you should be willing to forgive all offenses and sins against us without limit. In this parable of the unforgiving servant, Jesus is presenting a principle that is, basis, that is a basis of forgiveness uh, and is a commandment to all believers as seen in many other parts of the Bible. We see that in the Beatitudes and, and, and many other parts of the Bible that we need to show mercy unto others. We need to show mercy unto others. Um, so uh, the... Let me see here... The first thing we will look at in uh, going back to chapter 2 is verse 8. Verse 8, the royal law. You know, we're familiar with the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would do unto them. I don't know how much of us are familiar with the royal law. And I, I, to be honest, I didn't really 
put that together as something I memorized as a kid or something like that? It's the royal law according to verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you're doing well, it says. So the royal law is to love your neighbor as yourself, and that is what it is. We see that in the Old Testament, Leviticus, it says, uh, 1918, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus in the Beatitudes in chapter 5 of Matthew, 21 to 48, if you study it well, you see that he is emphasizing this point that you need to be uh, uh, loving your neighbor as yourself, loving your uh, fellow brothers as yourself. Again, in Matthew 24, verse 33 and, uh, to 40, we see people came to Jesus and asked him, uh, Rabbi, what is the master? What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. But there is one other one that is just as important, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so we see that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have a befitting uh, kingly royalty. We are, of course, chosen and a royal priesthood. And by the blood that Jesus has covered for us, we need to be willing to forgive others. Uh, it says that we need to love our brothers as we uh, love ourselves. You know, if you go to this uh, verse 10 now, it says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails to keep one point has become guilty of it all. For he has said, do not commit adultery. And he also said, do not murder. If you do commit adultery but do not murder, you have become a transgressor of pretty much all the laws, right? So how many of you, if, if, you, if you could stand up, how many of you have been perfect all your life? I don't see anybody standing up. Which means that each one of us, by birth, by our original Adamic sin, but also by our everyday activities, fall into sin knowingly or unknowingly. And so if it was the old standard, the standard of the law that said you have to keep all the laws to get to heaven, I didn't see anybody standing up. I don't think anybody would get to heaven. But God, Jesus, God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to create a new standard, which is the law of liberty, which is the law of liberty. If you will put that slide up for me. The law of liberty, what does that mean? It is a law of freedom. New covenant through Jesus' death and resurrection. Freedom from bondage and sin. And the gospel of Christ has brought us liberty. What the royal law is teaching us and what this new law, uh, the law of freedom and liberty is telling us is that every child of God, uh, for every child of God, the law of freedom triumphs over his judgment for us. So uh, it's not about keeping his law so much. It is understanding what the Lord Jesus has done for us in the cross and living in his freedom and living in his forgiveness. But at the same time, we need to understand and keep in mind that the rules that we will be judged by on the Bema seat of the Lord, uh, remember that we'll talk a little bit more about the different judgments, but on the Bema seat of the Lord, the saved ones will be based upon what you showed unto others. So if you were able to show mercy unto others, then you will be judged based upon that mercy. And if you did not, you will be judged based upon that lack of mercy that you showed. So if you look all throughout the Bible, there is a word that is mentioned. Um, uh, and in Malayalam, uh, here, this verse 13, it's Karana Gani Kindavana? Karana? Karana Ilata Nayavadi Undagum. Kani Kyatavana, right? That's the. Amen. Karana Nayavadi Jay Chaprasham Sikinu. So mercy triumphs over judgment. And what exactly does that mean? So there's two words of how the Lord loves in the Bible. It is the word hesed and it is the word agape. And so I want you to learn this word hesed with me. This word hesed means uh, something very peculiar. It's a Hebrew word, not a Greek word. It's a, a word that means the loving kindness of the Lord. And it talks about the loyal character of God. Throughout the Old Testament, we see 250 times where this word hesed is mentioned. This word hesed. This word cannot be 
uh, translated as one word in English. Uh, it has many different meanings. And so when it came to English, it came to mercy, kindness, steadfast love, covenant love, loving kindness. Uh, so many different words were used for this one Hebrew word, hesed. And so we see in the Old Testament, Abraham had a covenant and the Lord took care of him. It was the hesed love of Lord that took care of him. We see that the Israelites had a promise or a covenant relationship with the Lord and the Lord took care of them in the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Yes, they went through punishment for their sin, but they went through, uh, in the Old Testament, they, did, they were able to receive the hesed of the Lord. We also see this in uh, Ruth, how she was in a hesed relationship with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And we also see that Boaz has a hesed relationship, uh, in a sense, with uh, Ruth, where there is this loyal, loving kindness that is shown as a character of God that was shown by people. That is really the theme of the book of Hosea, but I won't go into it. But you, but you see also see in Psalms 136, so many times it says, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. The prophet Micah says, what does the Lord require of us to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our Lord? So we see that we are to show mercy or hesed to others because the Lord Jesus himself has shown hesed to us. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So just as Christ set an example and God sent his only begotten son and set an example, we are to be tenderhearted, forgiving one another and loving each other. The Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes, it goes into much more uh, detail. It says forgiveness is uh, something that we ought to do. The converse of this verse is seen in Matthew 5 verse 7. It says, blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown mercy. Doesn't that mean those who do not practice mercy will not receive mercy from the Lord? And we need new mercies from the Lord every day. Yes, it was a great act of mercy that Jesus died on the cross for us, but he will provide new mercies for us each and every day. But if we do not practice mercy, we will not receive the mercy of the Lord when we need it. And at the Bema Seat judgment of the Lord, we will not receive mercy either. In fact, I will take it a step further and said, cursed are the unmerciful, for they shall be shown no mercy. Cursed are the unmerciful, for they shall be shown no mercy. So a true Christian, a child of God, in light of the fact that, uh, that God has forgiven them of their sin, is to show hesed, or the loving kindness, the loyal love, the covenant love of the Lord unto others, to show compassion and mercy unto others. Amen. Because the Lord Jesus on the cross, what did he do? He took upon us and satisfied God's wrath, uh, all of our sins, and he was the perfect sacrifice. So that was mercy shown on the cross for us. And so we are to live in that freedom and to live in that forgiveness. If we're judging others based on the old law that says uh, it's about keeping laws, then we cannot be, sh be using the law of liberty or the law of freedom for ourselves. Now, this does not mean that we live any which way we want after we receive the Lord Jesus. If you're truly a child of God, there will be a change in your heart and your life will be full of grace and mercy naturally. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you will be able to do this. Uh, and uh, it is just a reminder that we need to have mercy triumph over judgment. Mercy triumph over judgment. When it says mercy triumphs over judgment, what it really means is that mercy boasts or glorifies or triumphs or wins over judgment. God's mercy will triumph over his judgment for every child of God who is in Christ. Whenever mercy and judgment is in conflict, that means mercy win, wins. When we have a choice to be merciful to someone or to judge someone, what is the natural byproduct as a true child of God? The Holy Spirit will lead us to show mercy. Being merciful shows our thankfulness for the Lord for what he has done for us. 
So if we don't show mercy, that means that we might not be truly saved. We might not know that we are truly saved or we're not showing the qualities of the Lord Jesus. But in particular, this is not talking about salvation in per se, but it's talking about the judgment seat of God. Everyone who is saved and is a child of God will need to go uh, before the Lord. It's called the Bema seat of God. The word Bema stands uh, is from the word, uh, the Greek word. When the Olympics first started, when you won something, they put a leaf over your uh, head, right? That's the Bema or the stand that you went on to get the first place and put the, the, the leaf over your head. So it's to give the reward for what you have done. Every child of God will need to stand before the Lord. And if you want to be judged by the law, then carry on. Be unmerciful. Um, and if you don't, then be merciful. Because that is what the Lord is teaching us here. That mercy triumphs over judgment. So let's get to the, to the uh, take-home points. The prescription. So what is the royal law? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your whole your soul, and your mind. You cannot say that you love God and cannot, lo cannot love your neighbor. That you cannot forgive your brother who has trespassed you, who has done something. And if you hold on to that, uh, to that grudge, then the question is, are we, really, are we really saved? Are we truly following the example of Christ? Are we being merciful? Amen. That it says... Be quick to forgive others as you have, given, as you have been given mercy. So if you understand uh, that truly the child of God is, uh, truly the child of God is forgiven of all of their sins. You know, there's nobody perfect when I asked anybody to stand here. And I appreciate your candid honesty about that. But do you realize that it is not something that, uh, that was easy to attain? The Father, the Lord, had a plan and a propitiation plan that he had to send his only begotten son into the earth to take the humble uh, form of a man and to die on the cross as we were meditating all week on the passion of Christ and all of the things that he had to go through. And the last few weeks we've been talking about the stigmata of the Lord, the, the things that he had to go through, the nails that had to go through his feet and his hands. We talked about what he accomplished on the cross uh, by, by the Lord Jesus. And that when he said, tell us to tie, which means it is finished. He was actually winning that victory for us, that he was gaining that victory for us. If that is the case, if you will not forgive others, will you be judged by that same standard at the judgment seat of Bima? Now you might say this is easy to say and how can you actually accomplish this practically? Practically, how can you accomplish this? So, uh, it, you know, um, there might be many different acronyms or techniques. One that I found in the medical literature was about uh, this four-step progression of compassion or mercy or showing the hesed of the Lord. Again, the hesed is to love as the Lord Jesus or the Lord Yahweh does. It's loyal love, unfailing love that endorses uh, and, and doesn't ask what is it in, in, in it for me? Because we live in a world that says, you know, I'll scratch your back if you can scratch my back. What can you do for me? But this hesed is not that. It's not, it, when people cannot do anything for you, what are you willing to do for them is what mercy or hesed is. So a four-step progression. Someone who is going through something, and, and I know that every one of us is going through different things. So one is to show up for them. Show up. That's the first step. Second is to take the step of understanding, understanding what they're going through. And then when the opportunity arises to move closer to your friend, your family, whatever they're going through. And there's a last step there, which is ACT. And it stands here for uh, the acronym SUMA. Uh, so you can remember it. SUMA, you know, you're familiar with the name SUMA. But uh, here it is, the four-step progression of compassion. And the last step is there. Because if you just have sympathy for someone... It doesn't really get to the point of acting. And hesed is to act on behalf of others based upon the love the Lord has given unto us. So compassion is a verb and it demands action out of us. As the worship team is coming up, let me conclude. What does it mean to love mercy? And what does it mean when mercy 
uh, demands mercy triumphs over judgment. The Lord Jesus has won the victory for us, and he has won it on the cross of Calvary. And we've been talking about that. The, our sin demands justice, however, and God's justice was propitiated. Was, uh, God's wrath was propitiated, and the justice of the Lord uh, of God was given by the Lord Jesus dying on the cross for us. And we have, who are sinners, have now been renamed uh, that we are forgiven. There's always this tension of mercy versus judgment. And um, Psalms 85, it says, none of us deserve mercy. But if anyone does sin, he has an advocate, a father, uh, a Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the propitiation for our sins, not only, but for the whole world, not only for us. So Jesus propitiated and satisfied the wrath of the Lord on the cross. So what difference does Jesus' mercy make in my life? It should first humble us. It should wreck us completely. It should make us fall on our knees. It shouldn't be something that you just hear about and, uh, uh, you know, maybe on Easter Sunday or, or on, on special days you, you remember. But it, the love of the Lord Jesus, the mercy of the Lord Jesus should humble us, should wreck us, should make us fall on our knees and to say, truly, the Lord gave his mercy for me on Golgotha. He converted a place of skull, a place of condemnation, a place of death and destruction, and he changed Golgotha into a place of deliverance and mercy. If I have received such mercy, if I receive new mercies of the Lord every single day, then how can I not be merciful to my brother, to my family? How can I not forgive for the sins of the fellow brothers and sisters? May God bless you all with these words.